Hola a todos. Very good to be here with you. I was in Spain a few years ago at, uh, you know, the center along the southern coast and was really glad to see how Dharma is spreading in Spain and more and more people interested in it. That's really good because the, the Dharma will really help you in your lives uh, very, very much. So it helps you in your life, this life, and it helps you uh, create the causes for happiness in your future life. And it also helps you create the causes for uh, full awakening. So our practice is very much one of creating the causes. Yeah. Sometimes we come to the Dharma and we want the results really soon. Okay, I've been practicing for one year and I haven't attained awakening yet. What's wrong? Um, you know, bodhisattvas spend three countless great eons and that's once they have actually generated spontaneous bodhicitta. So our thinking that we're gonna do things very quickly is uh, a little bit, little bit unrealistic. So uh, what we want to do, you know, because the, the title of this course is about creating aspirations during a degenerate time. What we want to do is create the causes, create the aspirations, start acting on those aspirations. And the happiness comes from doing that rather than being goal oriented. And, you know, I'm just plugging away and doing this and doing this. And then when I'm a Buddha, then, okay, then I get the reward. I'm happy. No, you're going to be a miserable practitioner like that. Okay. So you have to, we have to learn to be happy. Uh, creating the causes and being uh, really content that we found a, a path that actually works now. Yeah. And we have access to teachers. We have time to learn and practice. We have so many good conditions. And so to really aspire to make use of those and Take the joy from doing that, okay? Because otherwise, if we're just waiting for some abracadabra, fantastic experience to happen, then when it doesn't happen, we get very unhappy. Or when it happens and then we try so hard to recreate it, and we can't recreate it either, then again, we get unhappy. And that all happens because our motivation isn't, isn't correct, okay? We're, we're looking for some fantastic uh, experience of bliss that's going to come very, very quickly. But we want that without creating the causes for it. And without really changing the way our mind thinks and changing our views, uh, lessening the, uh, the disturbing emotions, okay? So do you get what I mean about, we're, we're um, how would I say it? We're, we're basically looking for worldly happiness in a quick, you know, quick, easy, cheap way. And that is very, that kind of attitude or motivation is very different than a Dharma motivation. Yeah, to really get our motivation uh, straight and not just be seeking some fantastic experience so that we can experience pleasure because that's the same motivation 
that we uh, do everything in our normal lives about. Yeah, from the time we wake up in the morning, all day long, you know, how can I have happiness? How can I get what I want? How can I have pleasure? And if we approach the Dharma with that same wish for immediate pleasure and happiness, then our mind really hasn't changed. Yeah. And following a spiritual path involves changing our mind. Okay. So this is really important. Um, you know, my, my teachers always emphasize our motivation uh, from the very beginning. And I think, you know, you're, you people are an FPMT center. So if you've heard teachings from Kyabche Zopa Rinpoche, you know that he'll spend an hour and a half on the motivation and then give the Dharma talk for another half hour, right? You know, why does he do that? Because the motivation is crucial, yeah? So uh, we have to keep coming back to that again and again and again. So having said that, let's take a moment and really generate the uh, aspiration for full awakening so that we can be of the greatest benefit to all living beings. And let's also make the aspiration and even the determination to do whatever it takes to attain full awakening because it's the best thing, the most meaningful thing that we can do with our life. And in doing this, we don't have to push. We don't have to compete. We just practice the Dharma at an even pace, according to what we're capable of. And so with that, let's have a happy mind to listen to the Dharma today. The title, you know, was, had to do with aspirations, you know, for a degenerate age, right? So I really, that word aspiration, it's, it's always been something that's intrigued me. Yeah. What is an aspiration? And what's the difference between a wish and an aspiration and between an aspiration and a determination? And what, which of these three are suitable at different times in my life and in my Dharma practice? So I was thinking in terms of the, the four immeasurables. Yeah. When we say how wonderful it would be if all sentient beings had happiness in its causes, may they have these. I will cause them to have these. And then we request Guru Buddha, please enable me to be able to do so. Okay, so there's a progression in there. Yeah, how wonderful it would be for all sentient beings to have happiness and its causes. And that indeed would be wonderful, wouldn't it? You know, if we could for a moment imagine all the people that we know and those that we don't know, uh, having happiness and the causes of happiness, okay? Then that's wonderful. That seems more on the level of a wish, doesn't it? You know, I wish that to happen. Or not even a wish, it's just saying it would be nice, but I'm not involved. 
how wonderful it would be if, yeah, but I'm not involved in making that happen or anything. And then the next sentence is, may they have happiness in its causes. So that's a, a little bit more powerful. It's not just how wonderful it would be if they had happiness in its causes. It's, you know, may they have these. So there's more energy behind that. But still, I'm not in, involved in it, you know? It's still wishing. Yeah, may they have happiness in its causes. But then the third one, I will cause them to have happiness in its causes. Now I'm getting involved. Okay, that's a big change because we can wish a lot of things and, uh, and wishing it were re we have no responsibility, no involvement. Uh, we just kind of think it would be nice, but we're, we're not involved in it. But when we say, I will cause them to have happiness in its causes, then we're involved. Yeah, there's some commitment on our part. And then understanding that it's difficult uh, to, to do that, then we request uh, the Guru Buddha for inspiration, for teachings, for encouragement, so that we can bring that about. So there's a progression here. Yeah. So when I look at aspiration, it seems to me that aspiration falls somewhere between a wish and a determination, okay? Because a wish is just a wish. An aspiration, somehow I'm starting to get involved. A determination is I'm going to do it. We start out with wishes, we develop to uh, aspirations, we go on to determinations. But if we just stay with the wishes, that's kind of uh, uh, a cop out, <laughs> you know, we're not uh, taking any responsibility. We're just wishing and leaving it to somebody else to do. But as we know, as practitioners on the Mahayana path, yeah, it's, we don't just pray for the Buddhas to do all of this. We are aspiring to become a fully awakened Buddha ourselves. Yeah, the, the aspiration to become a fully awakened Buddha, we're aspiring for that. But bodhicitta, although it's said to be an aspiration, I think we have to act, actually make that a determination. And that's what the power of compassion does. You know, why does His Holiness Dalai Lama emphasize compassion so much? Because when we can see other sentient beings' kindness, when we can see how miserable they are in, in cyclic existence, then, yeah, we want to do something about it. We can't just sit there and wish. We have to do. And his holy Dalai Lama talk, talks about that a lot. Yeah. Um, the, the importance of doing something. And it especially comes up around uh, climate changes, climate change. And uh, he says how many people pray to him to, uh, you know, do something about climate change and all these natural disasters. And he says, what can I do? You know, uh, we human beings created the problem. We have to solve it. You know, you people who drive cars and throw stuff away, you create the problem. You have to solve it. Don't just ask me and don't just aspire because that's not going to make it happen. 
Yeah, we have to act. And so it is with so many things in our life. Yeah, we, we have to start out by wishing and develop, then develop the aspiration and the determination. And then we have to really do something. Okay, but for lazy people like me, it's, it's so nice just to have wishes. Yeah, may all sentient beings have happiness in its causes. Oh, Christmas is coming. What do you write on all your Christmas cards? May everybody live in peace. May everybody have happiness in its causes. Yeah, may everybody have what they need. You write this on your Christmas cards. And then we turn around and get angry at somebody. Yeah. Somebody asks us for a donation to a charity and we say no. Huh? So you see, wishing is very nice. But then we go and do the opposite of what we're wishing for. Yeah. So if we want things to change, we have to be an active part of being that change. Okay. I think Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see. And that's, that's the way it is. So we have to work on our own mind, but we work on our own mind with the long-term goal of being of benefit to all others. So in that way, our practice is not selfish because we do what we can now to be of benefit. And we're trying to increase our own abilities so that we can be a greater and greater benefit in the future. Okay. So wish, aspiration, determination, action. Where does prayer fit in? Okay, sometimes instead of six perfections, we talk about 10 perfections. And one of the last four is the, sometimes it's translated as the perfection of prayer. Yeah, the Tibetan term is monlam. But I don't think that's such a good translation. I think of it more as the perfection of resolve of an unshakable resolve okay so we're not just wishing and praying we're resolving okay so what's the difference between prayer and having an unshakable resolve ourselves well a prayer is you know we pray to to buddha or maybe, you know, you used to pray to God or whoever you used to pray to, you know, and it's like, Buddha, 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 please make this happen. Okay. And Buddha, if you make this happen, you know, if you cure my friend of cancer, if you help my child have a good uh, marriage, if you help my other child have a, you know, get an education, if you help so and so, uh, you know, to recover from a disease, please, Buddha, please, I pray to you, make that happen. And while you're doing that, I'm going to sit and drink tea, and have some biscuits and relax. Yeah, because when we pray. We are praying to somebody, asking somebody else to make something happen. And we're saying, you know, my part is just to pray to you. And then I have no control. I can't do anything. So I'm going to drink tea and have some biscuits and relax. And you're the all-powerful omniscient Buddha. So you make it happen. Yeah. And when we think like that, we're turning Buddha, we're confusing Buddha with God. 
okay? Buddha is not God. It's not just another term for God, okay? So both God, yeah, who I don't really believe exists, but let's say for the as analogy, he does, okay? God is all powerful. He can make everything happen. So when we pray to God, if he's all powerful, he can make it happen, okay? Problem is God doesn't always come through for us. But anyway, when we make an unshakable resolve, then I'm involved, okay? Or when we pray to the Buddha, yeah, Buddha is making no claims about being all powerful. In fact, we say from the Buddha's side, he's eliminated all obscurations to being of benefit to sentient beings. Yeah, but he's not all powerful because he's up against the force of our karma. Who's created our karma? We have. So the Buddhas can only help as much as we are receptive, as much as our own mind is open, as much as karmically we have created the virtue that would enable the Buddha's efforts to bring about change. Okay, so here again, we see we have some part in it. Yeah, we have to purify, we have to create merit, we have to listen to teachings and practice them, and that will make us receptive to the Buddha's enlightened activity. So don't confuse Buddha with God and think that if you pray to the Buddha, the Buddha is going to be all powerful and whammo, it's going to happen. Because they say that if the Buddha could control everything and could do everything that we're praying and asking him to do, he would have already done it. Because the Buddha's compassion for us is stronger than our own compassion for ourselves. So if it were totally up to an all-powerful Buddha, he would have changed everything. But the Buddha can't because part of it depends on us. Okay, so big difference between Buddha and God. This is one of the big differences. And it also, again, points to why we have to act, why we have to do something and not just wish and not just pray that the Buddha or somebody else take care of everything for us. This actually uh, was something that really attracted me to Buddhism because it meant that uh, as, as individual practitioners, we have some power. If everything were determined by God, who created everything and managed everything and made everything happen, then I have no power to uh, change my own situation. But in Buddhism, we have that power and we have that responsibility. So there has to be a, a shift in our mind you know, that takes our responsibility and, and is happy to have the power and ability and capacity to change our own situation. We depend on the enlightened beings for inspiration, for teachings, for guidance, but we have to practice. So in, in English, I don't know if you have this expression in Spanish. You could tell me 
we say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So the Buddha can teach us. The Buddha can shower his enlightened activities on us, but he can't make us practice. And we can't hire anybody else to practice for us. Yeah. You can hire somebody to clean your house. You can hire somebody to fix your car. Yeah, you can't hire somebody to eat for you so that you'll be full or to sleep for you so that you'll be well rested. You have to eat and sleep yourself. And so it is with Dharma practice. We have to do these ourselves. So it's with that kind of attitude um, that we want to approach the Buddhist path. Again, thinking about the title, Aspirations for a Degenerate Age. I won't get into degenerate because I think we all know what that means. And we all are quite aware of the mess that, that our planet is in. And the mess that individuals, uh, you know, that the people ourselves and other people around us are in. Yeah. And the fact that all of us want happiness, we don't want suffering. And yet in our lives, we can't get everything we want and we uh, get the pain and misery and problems that we don't want, okay? So we're all aware of that. I'm not gonna go into that. What I'd rather talk about is the antidotes to that, okay? What can we do? And so to have aspirations for a degenerate time, like I said before, we. We have to go beyond the aspirations and act. And so in the seven point mind training, which some of you may have uh, studied before, it's a beautiful text. And it really talks about, there's a whole section on how to transform adversity into the path. And there's another section called elucidating a lifetime's practice. And so I thought this is a, a good uh, thing to talk about, you know, that uh, conforms to, to the title of what we all came to hear about. So, you know, elucidating a lifetime's practice, how to, uh, how to look at our life long-term and, uh, know how to practice in every situation that we encounter. And I think this is really the, the beauty of the Buddhist path is that you practice it in, in everything you come across in your life. It isn't just Sunday morning, dress up, you know, go to church, pray for all sorts of things, and, and then show off your new clothes and, and go out to lunch and, and gossip about other people afterwards. You know, what we're really trying to do is bring the Dharma into our lives. Yeah, unify our mind with the Dharma. Okay, so in under elucidating a lifetime's practice, there's uh, one subsection that's called blend the practice of one life with the five forces. So here uh, the Buddha is talking about five forces and we blend our life with these. These are five practices that we uh, include in our life uh, that help us to transform whatever situation we encounter into the path to full awakening, okay? So the first of these, yeah, there's five forces. The first of one 
is uh, our motivation in the morning. Okay, so when we first wake up, yeah, the mind is fairly clear. We haven't gotten involved in everything going on in the, in the day. And so it's very important to make a very strong motivation, a very strong resolution uh, to make our my life meaningful. And if we do this, when we first wake up, because the mind is clear, it makes a very strong imprint on the mind, okay? And it affects how we live the entire day. Okay, so what do we want? What aspirations or what determinations do we want to make in our morning motivation, okay? Um, the, I'll, I'll tell you the one I do. First is today, you know, as much as I possibly can, I'm going to not harm any living being. So that's the bottom line. Yeah, no matter what else goes on today, the most important thing I have to do is not harm anybody. Wouldn't you agree? But that's the most important thing, you know, going here, running there, doing all your errands. That is not the most important thing. Most important is that we don't harm anybody. And then we do our errands and we do all the go to work and all the activities with an attitude of First and foremost, I am not going to harm anybody through my speech, yeah, by lying, yeah, harsh words, divisive words, idle talk, yeah, gossiping, telling stories behind people's back, criticizing, insulting them. Yeah. So I'm going to be really careful with my speech today. Now, imagine how different your life would be if you were able to hold that motivation about your speech throughout the whole day. So that even if your colleague or your boss came in at work and said something unpleasant to you, you don't retaliate. You don't go into defensiveness and insult and anger and harsh speech. You know, when you come home from work and your kids are jumping and screaming and wanting attention, instead of screaming at your kids, be quiet, I'm tired from work. Yeah. Instead of that, you you remember, I'm not going to harm. So you sit down, get yourself quiet, then engage with your children in a friendly way. I mean, just think, we make that aspiration very strongly in the morning. And, you know, to the extent that we can keep that over the course of the day, we're going to be in a much better situation. That's just aspiring not to help harm anybody with our speech. Okay, now we also don't want to harm anybody physically. Okay, so if you have the strong aspiration not to harm anybody physically, then you're going to drive very carefully. You're not going to step on the gas pedal and go, and, you know, cut people off because you know that you could hurt somebody physically if you were doing that. Yeah. When you're waiting in line, yeah, or you're on the subway and you have to get out, you're not gonna push anybody because you know that that could be dangerous. Okay. Yeah. You're not gonna have an extramarital affair. That's a physical action because you know that that's just gonna bring a mess to your family and a mess to the other person's life as well. Yeah. You're not gonna take what hasn't been, been freely given to you 
Yeah. Because even if it's taking from your job or from a corporation, um, because you know that, that that's harmful to others. Yeah. And you're not going to kill any insects either because that's harming others. Yeah. So again, to, you know, if we make that aspiration first thing in the morning, I'm not going to help other, harm others with my speech or with my body. That's going to really guide our physical and verbal actions during the day. And it's going to make us a much easier person for other people to be with. Yeah. Sometimes when we don't have good relationships with other people, we kind of think, well, it's because they're like this and they're like that. But we never look on, well, maybe I'm not the easiest person to get along with. Yeah, when there's a problem with somebody, do you ever think, oh, maybe I'm speaking in a way that is harmful to them or I'm doing something that's harmful and think I need to change my behavior? Okay, so generating this, this motivation in the morning to not harm anybody really guides our actions throughout the day. And we're gonna be a much nicer person and we're gonna have much better relationships with people. And we won't create so much negative karma and we won't have so much remorse in our life. Mm -hmm. And then we're making a term determination to avoid harming others, not only verbally, not only physically, but also with our mind. Yeah, we're making the determination not to sit there and deliberately get engrossed in negative thoughts about other people. And I don't know about you, but for some of us, Oh, we can spend all day thinking about other people's faults and all day thinking about what they did to us to harm us. Any of you have that habit? One person, thank you. Two people, <laughs> three, four, five, six. Oh, okay. <laughs> A few people have this problem. Okay, join the club. I have this problem too, you know? And we have to admit it. We're with friends. We can admit that we have this problem. And we sit there. We find one thing that somebody did we don't like. We go round and around and around. And they said this to me and they said that to me. And who do they think they are? And I've got to retaliate. Otherwise, they're going to walk all over me. And this person is so mean. And all my other friends agree that this person is so mean. Everybody is on my side. That person has nobody on their side. I'm right. They're wrong. They're a horrible person. And then... You play that tape again in your mind and you go over again all the reasons why they're wrong and we're right and we're entitled to harm them back for what they did or gossipy about them and ruin their reputation behind their back. We can spend hours on this, can't we? Can't we? Well, one person, two people, three people. Oh, only four, <laughs> five. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We can spend a long time on this, can't we? Yeah. And then the whole day goes by. And at the end of the day, when we go to dedicate the merit, what do we dedicate? Even in our meditation session, yeah. have you ever spent a meditation session 
ruminating about all the bad things that people have done to you that you haven't deserved. You're in perfect meditation position. Okay. But what's going on in your mind? Everybody thinks you're, you're in samadhi. You're sitting perfect in your mind. My friend didn't invite me to her get together. And she'd also talk behind my back. And I thought she was a friend and you're in perfect meditation position. I thought she was my friend and she betrayed me. And I have another friend too. He did the same thing. Oh, why are people so mean to me? I don't deserve this. I'm so nice to them and they act like this. I need to say something and stand up for myself. Tell them to quit it. Whole meditation session. Then you hear, ding, the bell rings. You open your eyes and like, oh, where was I? And you realize you spent a whole session, but you weren't meditating. Yeah. You were sit th sitting there with your mind going around and around with critical thoughts. Okay. So when we make this determination in the morning yeah, to not harm others with our body, speech, and mind, it's going to make us more attentive to when we start thinking like this. And we'll be able to catch it and say, why am I wasting my time thinking about this? Because it is a waste of time, isn't it? Yeah. Cultivating negative thoughts about anybody, is that going to make you happier? Is that going to fulfill your Dharma aims? Is that going to do anything good for the world? No, it's a total waste of time. Okay. So to be able to find ours, you know, catch it when we start to do that and steer our mind back into some kind of Dharma thought. Like, okay, I was just complaining about all these people, but really, you know, they're just like me. They want to be happy and they don't want to suffer. And why are they doing the things that I find unpleasant? It's because they're unhappy. Yeah. How can I sit there and, you know, be so mad at somebody else who's unhappy? How about if I wish them well? How about if I wish them to have happiness? And so here you're going to go into wishes, but it's a virtuous wish. It's a positive wish instead of wishing that they get hit by a truck or something like that because you're so mad at them. But then sometimes when you try and wish them well, your mind says, but they don't deserve it. Why should I wish them well? They don't deserve happiness. They deserve to suffer. And then you stop and ask yourself, I'm just telling you what I do. I stop and I say, what kind of person am I that I'm going to derive joy if somebody else suffers? What kind of person does that make me if I wish for other people to suffer? That's 
not the kind of person I want to be. Yeah. I don't want to be somebody who takes joy in other suffering. <clears throat> so I gotta, I gotta change my mind here and come back to wishing them well. And if they have an opportunity that I don't have and they have something better than I have, I'm gonna rejoice instead of be jealous. Why not rejoice? They're happy. And we said in our morning prayers, may all sentient beings have happiness and, and their causes. So here's somebody is happy and I didn't even have to do anything. How about if I just rejoice? Somebody has happiness in this degenerate time in samsara. There's somebody who has happiness and has a good opportunity. And I rejoice that they have this. Okay, that makes for a lot better mental state for me, doesn't it? If I can think like that, than if I'm jealous and I want them to uh, suffer for something. Okay. So this very first thing in the morning that we do, generating a good motivation is extremely important. But what I said so far, is just one of the, I generate three things, actually four in the morning when I wake up. That was, that's the first one, not to harm anybody. The second one, yeah, and, and you do this, you don't even have to get out of bed. You don't have to sit in meditation position. You do it, you know, even when you're lying in bed, yeah, or just first getting up in the morning. First thing, today, as much as possible, I am not going to harm others with my body, speech, and mind. And then the second motivation, today, as much as possible, I'm going to benefit others. Yeah, I'm going to bring happiness in whatever big or small way I can. Okay, now we don't need to be Mother Teresa or the Dalai Lama to do this. Sometimes we think, you know, oh, I wanna benefit sentient beings, but you know, who am I? I wanna change the whole world, snap my fingers and make all the problems go away. Okay, I don't have the power to do that. So. You know, I can't do anything. Uh, we're very extremists, you know. Of course, nobody has the power to snap their fingers and change the world. If they did, they would have done it, okay? But we do have the power to bring happiness and joy to the people around us and to the people that we're in contact with, okay? And these are sometimes the people that we treat the worst, like our family members. Okay, now you're, you may be wondering what in the world I'm talking about. Okay, when you get angry, how do you speak to a family member that you're angry with? Yeah, you call up, I don't know about you, I call up the whole long list of small faults that they've done because I've kept track of every single mistake, every single mean thing they did. And now I give it to them. Okay. Now, who do you speak, speak the worst to? A family member or a stranger? Would you ever say to a stranger what you say to somebody you love? Would you? Would you ever call a stranger the things that you call the people you love? Would you never insult a stranger? Or 
be angrily hysterical in front of a stranger the way you are with somebody you love. It's incredible, isn't it, you know? So when we make this determination to be a benefit to others, yeah, first way we're going to benefit is not to harm. First way we're going to benefit is to listen. Yeah, listen to your family members. Just listen. You don't need to agree with everything. Listen. Be empathetic. Yeah. Say something encouraging to them. Yeah. Speak to your children with kindness. Now, I don't know about, about how things are in Spain, but here, sometimes in families, it's like the, the parents become like drill sergeants in the army. You know, the sergeants in the army stand up straight, walk properly. Your posture is terrible. Did you do your homework? Did you brush your teeth? Go take a bath. You're late for school. Go to the bus and get in, get in the bus, get in the car, quick, eat your breakfast. Comb your hair, you're a mess. Okay? How many people talk to their kids like that? Yeah, really, like, an, like a sergeant in the army. And these are your precious children who you love. And as parents, do you take time to, you know, especially when your kids come home, to say, how was your day? Do you know who your, who your kids' friends are? Do they talk to you about their friends? Do they talk to you about what they learned in school? Do you ask them about their friends and what they learned in school? Okay, these kinds of things, they're small, but they are incredibly beneficial for children. Yeah. And as adults, we often forget that. Yeah, we're so focused on we have to get to work and, you know, make money and do everything. But actually, it's much better for the family if we go slowly and we take time to really listen and talk to each other from the heart. And that's one way to benefit people. When you go to work, yeah. Do you go to work and smile at the people who you work with? Or do you just kind of go in the office, put your things down, and do what you have to do? And like, uh, yeah. It makes a huge difference if you smile at the people you work with. If you work in an office and it's dirty around the coffee machine, you know how it usually is, people spill coffee and they spill stuff and, you know, all over the place. Do you just leave the mess for somebody else to clean up? Or do you think, oh, it takes me, yeah, all of a minute and a half to wash, you know, wipe off the, the coffee counter and make it clean for everybody who comes. There's so many small things that, that sensitive things that, re, that make other people's lives easier. When you're driving and somebody else wants to come in front of you, do you motion to them and let them go in front? Or do you speed up ahead because you don't want to let anybody else in in front of you? Okay, small things to benefit others, but it makes a big difference. One example, a friend of mine many years ago, she was telling me that when she was quite young, she was very, very upset. She had some suicidal thoughts and she was walking down the street in where she lived and a stranger walked past her and smiled. 
and said hello. And she told me that one stranger smiling and saying hello to her made her realize that there's kindness in the world. And she abandoned all the, the suicidal thoughts. Yeah, one person just looking at her and saying hello and smiling. Okay. So there's small things. We don't need to be Mother Teresa and the Dalai Lama. Okay. So look around in your life and notice what's going on with other people. When you're in the grocery store and somebody's kid is crying. Yeah. Yeah. So some child is just screaming. Okay. People People okay. are in the, in the English channel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So oh, it's okay. So, you know, this kid's is shrieking. Do, do you know one of the nicest things you can do is start playing with the child. Yeah. Sometimes because you're a chain a stranger, the child will go like this, but they stop crying. And then you play peekaboo or you do some funny thing. Yeah. And the parent is so relieved. Oh, you know, I not everybody's looking at me because my child is shrieking. Yeah. So that happened to me one time on a plane. I was sitting next to a woman with a, a young child, a baby. And, you know, she was exhausted. And, the, you know, the baby was starting to fuss. And I took the baby and I kind of played with the baby for most of the, the train flight to give this mother a little break. Yeah, so just things like that. It's small, but we can really, um, we can show other people that there's kindness in the world. And that's very important. You know, we don't have to do huge things. Okay, so that's the second motivation. As much as possible, I'm going to benefit others. Yeah. Third motivation. Actually, before, um, yeah, okay, I'll do the third one. The third one is I'm going to keep bodhicitta in my heart as much as I possibly can today, okay? So we've heard so much about this aspiration to become a fully awakened Buddha in order to benefit others. And so you make that determination, I'm gonna keep, that aspiration in my heart as much as I can. And I'm going to act with that aspiration. Okay. So really thinking long term, because it's going to take us a long time to become a Buddha. Yeah. But that's okay. Because we have found the correct path now. Yeah. So when you, when you really have that determination, you know, to keep bodhicitta in your mind during the day, then whatever little things arise during the day that disturb your mind, you don't put so much attention on them because your mind is looking long term. Okay. When we look long term, the small things don't matter very much. And we're able to let them go instead of making big deals about them. Okay. Third one, keeping bodhicitta in my heart, in my mind as much as possible today. And the fourth one is today as much as possible, I'm going to remember impermanence, that things are changing moment by moment. And I'm going to remember that they lack any inherent 
substance. That things appear to be inherently existent, but they, that's a false appearance. You know, that actually things are impermanent. If we remember impermanence, that really helps us to have a peaceful mind during the day. Because again, yeah, instead of getting angry at situations that are changing moment by moment, yeah, and putting so much energy into getting angry at them, we just realize they will change. I don't need to get upset. And instead of our craving and our desire and our attachment taking over, I want this, I want that, I need this, I want that, give me this. Instead of acting like that, we'll realize, oh, all these things that I'm wanting, they're changing moment by moment too. They're not going to last. So if they're not going to last, they're not going to give me any lasting happiness. So I don't need to grasp at them like that. Okay. And then your mind relaxes again. So other aspirations you can generate in the morning. Um, yeah. Is to be very uh, vigilant to have this mental factor of introspective awareness that monitors your mind. And the moment you see, you know, a, a non-virtuous thought or a negative emotion or something, you notice it right away and you apply the antidotes and you shift your mind so you don't let it get stuck in negativity. If you're not suppressing emotions, yeah, you're not suppressing the negative emotions. You're just seeing that get, letting yourself get stuck in them is bringing you misery and not happiness. And since you want happiness and not misery, just let those thoughts go. Because anyway, they're all proliferations of our own afflictive mind. Yeah, they're all just proliferations of our opinion factory. Uh, do you have an opinion factory? Anybody have? Yeah, I have an opinion factory. If you ever need an opinion, my opinion factory is always open. Just ask me, I'll have an opinion on anything and everything, okay? And my opinions are always right. They are never wrong, never, okay? And that's why people should listen to my opinions because if they listened, everything would be go so much better in life. But you see, this is, is really the cause of the world's problem is that other people do not listen to my opinions. Yeah. And I offer them freely. I don't even charge. Yeah. I give people advice. They don't even have to ask for advice. I will give them lots of advice about how to run their life. And I will give them lots of advice about how to treat me and what they should do and what they should not do. And if they followed my wonderful advice, they would be happy, I would be happy, all problems would be solved, you know? But you know what the problem is in the world? That I give people advice and you know what they say to me afterwards. When they're nice, they say, mind your own business. When they're not nice, it's a string of swear words. They reject my advice, my opinions. They don't know what they're missing out on. Terrible, isn't it? Okay, so 
beware of your opinion factory during the day. Yeah, it, let it close down. Pretend there's a pandemic in your opinion factory and everybody has, can't work at the factory anymore. They're sent home to work at home, okay? And your opinion factory shuts down. Your advice factory goes out of business. Yeah? Oh. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, so we're gonna be vigilant and really watch what's going on in our mind. And if we're, our mind, our thoughts are, are slipping, we're gonna cut them off at the pass and we're going to come back. You know, it's always good to come back to the four immeasurables. May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May they be free of suffering and its causes. May they never be separated from sorrowless bliss. May they abide in equanimity, free of bias, attachment, and anger. Come back to that and really think about that. It's so much nicer than thinking negative thoughts about somebody. So we have a few minutes for questions, maybe answers. It sounds like this is a problem throughout the entire organization so that other people, everybody knows the corruption goes on and everybody's looking the other way. Is this the situation? Because the answer I give is going to be very different if it's one individual than if it's the whole system. Yeah. If it's one individual who's stealing. Yeah and you're in charge and it's somebody underneath you who you're responsible for, then you need to go to that person and say, you know, present the evidence and say, we know this is going on. Yeah. What, why are you stealing? Yeah. What's happening that, uh, that you're stealing? And let them explain why they're doing it if they can. Because yeah. you may be surprised at the answer. They may say, uh, my, my parent's sick and I need extra money for the, for the medical bills. Okay, they may say something like that. Or they may just be evasive, in which case, you know, they're just stealing be because of, of their own greed. Yeah. And so, you know, you'll deal with those two situations differently, depending on when you confront the person, what happens. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you have to give them a warning and say that you're going to report them and or you're going to fire them if this kind of behavior continues. And then you devise a system where they are accountable to you, where they they know that you're tracking what what uh, they're managing, okay? If it's the whole system is corrupt, yeah, and everybody in the company knows it, then it seems to me there's two things to do. Uh, and you can choose one is be a whistleblower and go to the authorities and, you know, keep the evidence and go to the authorities with the evidence and report it. We had something in the US uh, just a few weeks ago, somebody who worked for Facebook, an employee. Yeah, she was seeing how uh, the whole company was saying that they're doing things to benefit others, but actually they were making choices depending uh, on how they could make more money. So she gathered the evidence. She didn't just make blind accusations. She gathered the evidence and then went to the press and went to uh, the, you know, some of the government people too and reported it. And she had the evidence. Yeah. So it's not just, you know, 
trust my word because that's not going to do anything. You have to present the actual evidence. So that's one choice. But if you don't want to be a whistleblower, it's scary for you or you're getting death threats or whatever, then look for another job. Yeah, don't be complicit in, you know, making this happen. And if you're unhappy at, at your job and you feel like it's, it's, you know, something is harmful, then quit and look for another job. Yeah, you'll find another job, don't worry. Yeah. But that, that will make your mind much more peaceful than staying at a job where uh, you feel complicit in dishonesty. But you have to remember when people ask me about personal situations, I don't have the chance to get the details and to learn actually what the situation is. So what I'm saying in response is very general. Yeah, whoever asked the question, you have to think if this applies to your situation. Don't just accept what I say because I don't know the situation completely. I know it by a one sentence long question. Okay, so this is what is difficult for me when people ask me personal questions like this, you know, in a forum like this, where I don't really know the, the actual situation. Other questions? What is more helpful to me is if people ask me not what they should do, but how they should transform their mind. Okay, that I can give you advice on, yeah? how to keep a peaceful mind, how to transform your mind. But what to do in a situation, yeah. And, and it's very interesting because people usually, when we have problems, we say, what do I do? What do I do? And from a Dharma perspective, what do you do? What do I do is not the first question we should be asking. The first question should be, how can I see this situation in a constructive way in align with the Dharma? How can I calm my mind in this situation by applying a Dharma antidote? That's what we want to do first. Because if our own mind isn't calm, then no matter what we do, the motivation is going to be rotten and it probably won't be very effective, our action.